what we're going to talk about today is the future. The future is a, is a term that I haven't seen that much in the news or, or in the media the way it used to be. There, there was a time in America not that long ago when the future was a, a very exciting thing. There were, there, th this, was, th this is a book by Arthur C. Clarke. Some of you guys might know of him. Uh, he did the movie, uh, he wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey. And he was a scientist as well. He actually developed um, satellite technology. And he just wrote stuff back in the 60s about how incredible and how wonderful things are going to be in the future. And I was, I was there. Um, actually, I learned about this book from, we have a guest here tonight, Paul Hewitt, who's a science educator himself. And I took his class a long time ago. And he turned me on to this book. And Arthur Clarke, um, he talked about um, technological developments like um, the uh, fusion, hydrogen fusion, which is a clean, a clean type of nuclear power that we've been trying to get uh, and haven't done it yet. Um, the other one is he, he had an idea about a device called a fusion torch, which as an environmentalist, I was really interested in that because it's the ultimate recycling tool. So all these things, now I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but I'm, th these ideas have been around for a long time. And guys like Arthur Clark um, were, were, you know, one of, the pe one of the people popularizing thought about the future. <clears throat> okay, contrast that to what we got going now. Um, this is a book by a guy named George Marshall. It's about climate change. And it's mostly about why people don't even, it could just as well be, you know, it says don't even think about it. It's, it's talking about how people don't want to think about climate change. But it, it, it could also be about don't even think about the future. Because it, it's, not in the, it's, it's not at the forefront anymore the way it used to be. When, when, when the Apollo space program was going and all those things, it was really exciting. And so I want, what I want to talk about today is um, we can get excited about the future again. And, and there's, uh, there, there's a lot of things going on that um, are very encouraging. One of the things that in, in the book that I just showed you, um, he talked a lot about why it's so hard to get people to, to talk about climate change, to talk about strategies for fixing it. And so I read through the whole first three quarters of the book just hearing about all the doom and gloom stuff. And I was finally, OK, tell me what works. And one of the things he, he said that works is, as an educator and as a citizen, tell your stories. Tell personal stories. Get people talking. So that's what I'm going to do here today. I'm going to, I'm going to weave in um, the latest facts about the prospects for infrastructure change. Um, and, and I'm going to weave that in with personal stories that, that you know, show how I got to that conclusion. OK, so first we're going to go through the problem. The obvious problem is the obvious elephant in the room. Um, we've got these things going on that you know, people don't want to think about. You know, uh, we, we've got multiple factors um, you know, coming down at once, greenhouse gases, depleted aquifers, overpopulation, smog, urban sprawl, um, a climate crisis. And what they have in common is uh, fossil fuel addiction. There's, there's, I'm not saying everything is to blame <laughs> to, to fossil fuel addiction, but it, it's a big factor. R right now, we've, we've got this society that is addicted to a fuel source that's not sustainable. And, and, and that's got to change. And, and we, we think that we, we have to change our lifestyle to change that, and we don't. But that's, you know, people don't know that. OK, so the first thing going on with fossil fuel addiction is we're, we're, out, we're almost out of cheap oil. We still have oil. And, and we've, got a net, we've got a temporary um, decline and reduction in gas prices. Don't count on that lasting very long. We've got a temporary um, low price for natural gas because of all the fracking. That's not going to last very long. All the cheap oil is already gone. We've already dug all the easy, low-hanging low fruit. Now what we have, to, we have to dig much deeper and drill you know, through the ocean floor and do all these crazy things to get the oil. And, and so it's, it's just in decline. It's cheap oil is gone. The other, the other issue is obviously climate change. And this, um, this has just gotten a lot of controversy. 97% um, of the scientists who study this, they agree that it's, it's, it's real, it's happening, and, and we caused it. And, and if, you, if you did a poll, there's been surveys done about how many Americans um, think that most scientists think that it's, that, that, that it's you know, for real. 
most Americans think that it's controversial, that it's, you know, oh, well, some say yes, some say no. It's not controversial. It's the people who are in a position to know are, are, are unanimous. Okay, so there are some assumptions to this presentation. Uh, the first one is urgency. Um, we've got a problem, and it's, it, we, we have to do something about it. And number two, what we're doing now is not enough. It's not, we're not handling it. There's a lot of talk. There's not a lot of action. And so things have to change in that department. OK, number third, the third assumption is that, and this is good news, paradigm shifts happen. Infrastructure revolutions happen. And they usually happen when they have to happen. So crisis, you know, in a way you could say the crisis is the opportunity. This, this is, you know, hopefully we can solve things in time, but there are solutions here, and, and hopefully um, we're going to, you know, we're going to be on them. Okay, so um, what we're looking for is a 21st century infrastructure shift, and we need it. And, and what I'm going to talk about today is energy, transportation, water, and waste, and the fact that hydrogen it revolutionizes all four. It, you know, it, it goes, and I've gone through these one at a time. So we're going to go through these one at a time, and I'm going to show you how. Now, one of the questions is, why is this taking so long? Um, there's, a, there's a video on YouTube of Jack Nicholson in 1978 driving around in a hydrogen car. And then he, he parks it, and then he goes, and there's drips coming out of the tailpipe. He puts them in a glass and drinks it, just to demonstrate the only thing that comes out of the tailpipe is pure water. 100% pure water. And, and he was just saying, you know, using his celebrity status to try to get people to, to see that, uh, you know, this is the wave of the future. This was back in 78. What's been going on for 30 years? And, and what's been going on is um, it, it's just been controversial. There's, just, there's entrenched interests who, who like things the way they are and, and don't want it to change. And, and so um, they, one, of the, one of the phrases you're going to see is this, this phrase called, it's the chicken and the egg problem, OK? This, this is, uh, and we'll, we'll revisit this, but this is the standard answer that you hear. Why don't we have a hydrogen society now? Why didn't we have one 20 years ago? And they say, well, um, the chicken and the egg problem is, um, you know, who's going to build hydrogen cars if there's no hydrogen gas stations? Who's going to build hydrogen gas stations if there's no hydrogen cars? You know, that, that's the, you know, that, that's, that's the official version of it. There's lots of different variations on it. Here, here's the, yeah, there it is there. OK, so, um, so I'm going to tell you some personal stories now. Um, the, f the first thing, I, I'm, I'm teaching here at Academy of Art now. And then in the late 90s, I was also teaching at Academy of Art. But I was teaching over in the Computer Education Center. And I was teaching computer graphics to people who were going to go to Hollywood and to make games and, and do 3D animation for, for these other purposes. So um, these are examples of animation that I did in the 90s. And uh, most of it was just, I was just infatuated with 3D animation. I just wanted to do, that's all I could think about. Um, I had been an environmentalist, and I just got seduced by computer graphics. And actually, a, a lot of these are scenes from a, I did a doctoral dissertation um, where I made an educational game to teach, it's based on science fiction, to teach physics to middle schoolers. And I, I, I had a doctoral committee. Actually, my friend Paul here was on that committee. And uh, so some of this you haven't seen in a long time. Um, but anyway, this is, this is the kind of stuff I did. And, and I was happy enough doing this. Um, but then at a certain point, I just realized my back, you know, w w what about environment? What about, you know, I studied urban planning in undergraduate. What about that? So I decided in 2000 that, OK, it's time to just apply computer graphics to what I really cared about, and that's urban planning. Um, and um, so the first thing was uh, th th there's this new term that I, I didn't know about this until about 2000, the, the, the phrase new urbanism, the, the idea that you know, there was a time when people were fly, you know, moving to the suburbs, trying to get away from the city. And then in the 90s, all of a sudden, this term came out where it's like, hey, let's make the cities great again. Let's go back to the city. But how do we, how do we encourage that? So, so I started doing what, what are called photo simulations. And so these are, these are just various jobs I've done. Photo simulation usually consists of before and after. So there's before and there's after. Um, you can go just 
you, I usually like to have them synchronized so that you can just see exactly what the changes were. Okay, so there's one. Um, here's here's a, this is just at, you know regular street in anywhere USA, um, and the idea is placemaking. How do we make how do we make a, a landscape in the in, in, a, in an urban place that um, you know people want to be, people want to hang out there. I, I have classes where I teach this, and one of the things I say to the students is. I want you to make a place where you would want to spend your personal time there, you know, even if you didn't have to. I mean, you would go out of your way to spend your time there. That's, that's the def definition of a place. Okay, so here's your typical suburban strip. And, then, uh, and so I've done dozens and dozens of these things. And one of the things I noticed is after a while, they start all looking the same. I, I try to bring, you know, put unique, uniqueness into each one. Uh, and then from there, I started, when I was studying urban planning in undergraduate, I was particularly interested in transportation planning. And so I gravitated toward transportation again. And, and this is, th now this is a photo simulation. I wish I could say I did this one. I didn't. Somebody else did this one. But there's like a 20 lane freeway <laughs> leading to the smoggy metropolis. And it's just like, is this, is this modern life? Is this what we did all this great scientific breakthroughs for? So. Um, the next thing here, oh yeah, just how bad does it have to get before? Now, while this is still up, it's not just the smog. It's not just the greenhouse gases. There are too many cars. It doesn't matter what, what's in the gas tank. There's too many cars right now. Um, and, and there was a time in this country when we had you know, a nice balance between trains and cars. I guess it was in the 20s, maybe you know, stretching into the 30s. You know, where if you wanted to go on a train, you can go on a train. If you wanted to go on a car, you could. There wasn't too much traffic, so either way worked out pretty well. Well, we've lost that. We've, got, we've just got way too many cars now. So I got interested in transportation. And so um, I did this. Um, I did a job for California High Speed Rail in 2004. And um, this, this, to me, like re rekindled my enthusiasm for the future. This is, this is something that really is happening all over the world. Countries all over the world are building high-speed rail, <laughs> except for the US in a lot of ways. So, <clears throat> so I had a lot of fun doing this. And I also, uh, you'll see in a second here, I had a choice to either do animation to get interior shots or just go to France. So I chose to go to France and just shoot, shoot video in France. So these are all shots of high-speed rail cars. Um, and some of them are really nice. And I was just infatuated with high-speed rail. And, and I mean, to some extent, I still am. Um, but you know, this, this is one real solid infrastructure change that is happening all, all over the world with regard to transportation. Now this is, this is LA to San Francisco, 220 miles an hour. This is, uh, oh, I, I, put, I purposely put gridlocked freeway there, <laughs> Highway 280. And then they're, they're actually, um, this tunnel, they're still trying to get funding for this tunnel. It's a $1 billion tunnel. And this is the train station over at 4th and Townsend, and they're actually building this now. So it's kind of nice to see something that gets modeled, built once in a while. Um, they're doing a different design than this. I had to come up with a design myself because they didn't really have much. They just had the rough parameters. So, so this was my first major project in doing, you know, real, pretty realistic. Now things have come a long way since 2004. Animation's gotten a lot better, and so um, it, it's it's really it's still really an exciting thing to do. And it and it just it seems like this is a good way to visualize the future and get people excited about the future. OK, so that was the client, Transbay Joint Power Authority. OK, so now here, th so after that, I started doing a lot of this kind of stuff. So these are just various animations of jobs I've been doing. Um, I've worked for all of these uh, <laughs> transit agencies. And um, it's, uh, what I found is that I've, I've taught about, I don't know, a couple, at least 100, maybe 150 people how to do photo simulations. Uh, so, so now. A lot of places do photo simulations in-house. They don't hire me anymore. But there's not that many people doing animation. So I, and, and it's one of the things I want to teach in my class here is, is uh, some animation, because I really um, I think animation uh, really captures people in ways that stills don't. So anyway, so these are, these are various jobs. Um, 
Okay, so um, I was happily going along doing animation um, for transportation, and then, um, and I, now here's another example of the problem with cars. It's not just the fumes, it's not just the greenhouse gases. They take up too much room. This is, this is near Folsom, California. Look at the parking lots. This is crazy. This is crazy stuff. Okay, so then I got introduced to uh, a visionary train uh, developer named Christ Christopher Swan, and he, he was this kind of reclusive guy who had this vision for a, this amazing train that ran on hydrogen. And so um, I just looked at his stuff, and he looked at my stuff, and I compared this to high-speed rail, and I realized, hey, you know what? This is way better. This is High-speed rail is focused on speed. They're really into this, let's go really fast. This is more focused on full service rail, where the, the, the idea is you can go anywhere you want in California on a nice train and have a good time doing it. Why do you have to go so fast if you're having a good time? That's the idea. So this would be the most advanced railway system in the world. Um, now, since this happened, this, this was 2005, there are several train companies in the world now going hydrogen. The German, the German government just ordered 40 hydrogen train sets from the, from the high-speed rail maker uh, Alsum. So things are, in China, they're, they're going to they're do uh, hydrogen cha trains. Um, the, the, Amer the BNSF freight railroads are doing hydrogen locomotives. So this is, this is happening. Um, but no one has come up with a comprehensive system um, like this so far. One of the, th one of the deals is um, you make your own power with the railway track. So uh, you could, just on the ties alone, you can get about a third of the electricity you need and with that electricity, you make hydrogen, and then the, the trains run on hydrogen. A, a hydrogen train is really an electric train. All the hydrogen does is run a fuel cell, which keeps the batteries charged. So it's really an electric train. But unlike other electric trains, it doesn't have overhead wires, and it doesn't have um, third rails. It can go in tunnels without any fumes. And so by having a hydrogen train, what you end up with is the most flexible rail car ever developed. That's, that's the promise of hydrogen trains, flexibility. And when you have flexibility, all of a sudden it becomes economical to run these trains all kinds of places where right now it would be too expensive. Okay, so this is, this, this is a map of all the, tr all the routes that it would go. So you got complete coverage of the big metropolitan areas, uh, San Francisco and LA. And then all the tourist places. People want to go to Tahoe. They want to go to Yosemite. They want to go up and see the Redwoods. They want to see the coast. They want to go to Las Vegas. They want to go to San Diego. So you can pretty much go anywhere you want. And the idea of this system is that it would make money because it would, it would be profitable because it's taking a holistic approach to, to train, to, to railway development. OK, so here it is up at Lake Tahoe. And here it is in the Redwoods. And here it is on the way to Lake Tahoe. I, I, I'm into the mountains, so I have a lot of stuff. I've, I've done dozens of photo simulations for Sun Train. Um, and then here it is at a, just a, a normal um, suburban place. Um, and you'll notice here that um, the, train, there, the train here, uh, is, we, we got so, tracking solar panels all over the station. We have vans here. Um, the idea was door-to-door -door service. You buy a ticket, you don't just go from train station to train station, you go from door-to-door, -door, and those vans are coordinated with information technology. So it really, it really works, um, and, it, and it's really convenient. Here it is in San Francisco on, on, on Geary Street. Um, here it is on the Golden Gate Bridge, and this, this, was, uh, this has been studied. You could put trains on the lower deck of the Golden Gate Bridge, and it would, it would solve huge problems. And one of the things about it is um, you've got uh, a, a really enjoyable ride because, because of uh, information technology, the driver doesn't have to be up in front. The driver can be back a ways. And so the, you could have people sitting in a lounge car that sees a nice view through the window. OK, typical photo simulation. Those are all my friends, my neighbor and my friends. And um, sometimes I have green screen parties where I have friends come over and they pose like they're on a train. And, um, anyway, we have lots of fun. Um, here's just a, so people say, how, the, how would we ever afford something like this? And, and the, the, the reply is, how do we afford not to do it? Look at all, there's a whole bunch of economic reasons to do this. And, and it, would, it would be a big, giant project that would employ thousands and thousands of people. Um, it, would, it would effectively compete with cars, and so it could, it could effectively end urban sprawl. 
Um, anyway, I could go on and on. I'm not going to because I want to get to hydrogen. But uh, anyway, SunTrain was my first exposure to hydrogen. That's where I first started learning about it. And what I did with it is I ended up writing two books. Um, I wrote this one is the first one. It's called Mr. Swan's Big Idea. And then the feedback I got on this was that there wasn't enough pictures in it. They, it should be more like National Geographic where you can just go to every page and there's color pictures all over. I didn't have all the, all the simulation, all the photo sims when I did that one, but when I did this one, I did. So I got two books. And um, so <sighs> what happened was this was supposed to be a company, and there were people who were at, in the leadership position. And so far, at least, they haven't proven to be up to the task. And it's a giant task. I mean, you'd have to have somebody really, really talented to do, do this. But it's a great idea. And, it's, and so it's sitting on a table right now, and hopefully, um, hopefully it, can, it can move ahead at some time coming up. So with that on the table, what I did is, is OK, I'm gonna, so that's transportation. Now, now let's move toward, what about hydrogen? Let's talk about hydrogen. There's something amazing going on right now behind the scenes that is about to burst onto the world stage. It's quietly gathering momentum and is only two years away. Few people know about it. Everybody's going to hear about it. The consequences are huge. The clock is ticking. Okay, Here's more so detail on 10 to 20 year plan. First, we wind down and then terminate fossil fuel use. All of it. Besides oil and coal, this includes natural gas fracking and oil shale. Gone. We also rid ourselves of nuclear power plants once and for all. At the same time, we bite the bullet, swallow the costs, and rapidly ramp up distributed solar energy generation everywhere. Because of mass production and economies of scale, the costs for solar installations plummet. And because we no longer bear the burden of fossil fuel addiction, we quickly recover our investments. With solar energy plus wind and other renewables, we make hydrogen. The historic changeover to a hydrogen-powered world happens faster than expected. Fifteen years, and we're over the hump. Like the cell phone or the internet, it starts out slowly, then goes viral. The methodology for change will involve everything from pure market forces and the lure of new consumer products to non-profit grassroots media campaigns. We tap into people's desire to do the right thing and to reap the lifestyle rewards of energy independence. We're living in precarious but exciting times and there's an opportunity for truly great things to now happen. Stay tuned. Okay, so I have a website called solarhydrogenfuture.com. So if you want to see, most of this stuff is on there. So. Um, and the idea was to just, um, I'm seeing that there's two, there's two ways that this could happen. One is the corporate way, and, and Toyota is a pretty big corporation, and they're jumping full, full head in it. And then there's the grassroots way, which is what I'm trying to um, work on with the website that I did. Okay, so climate change is real. We need, we need an alternative to fossil fuels as soon as possible, not 20 or 30 or 50 years from now. Nuclear power is not going to do it. It's too dangerous and it's too expensive. By the way, the reason it's too expensive is because there's so many safety regulations now. It didn't used to be so expensive, but now it is because there's just, you know, to, to, make, it, to make them as safe as they need to be takes a lot of extra money. So it, it's, just, it's just not worth it. Okay, so, uh, so realistically, solar and wind are the only options. Now, notice the operational word here is dominant as our dominant energy source, OK? There's all kinds of renewable energy sources, but the dominant one is going to be solar. And the, um, <clears throat> if solar is a variable energy source, sometimes the sun's shining, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's not. Um, so you have to have a way to store it. And if you don't have that, it's not going to work. It's not going to work on a big scale. Right now, uh, a lot of uh, uh, batteries are used a lot. They're not good enough. For large-scale deployment of, of solar, batteries aren't good enough the way they are now. Now, some people say, oh, well, we're working on these new miracle batteries, and that'll change everything. Maybe they will. I, I hope they do, you know? But right now, batteries don't do it. Hydrogen um, seems to be the best way to store energy. Now, one last thing. Right now, a lot of people who have solar energy, they feed it back to the grid. And, and that is the grid kind of functions as a battery in some ways. 
that works fine as long as not too many people do it. Is, is when a lot of people start pumping solar energy into the grid, it wreaks havoc, havoc with, with uh, what's called grid balancing. This is happening in Germany right now. Germany's the leader in solar energy, and they're having to do all kinds of things to buffer you know, all the extra solar energy they're getting, and that's why Germany is the leader in hydrogen right now. Germany is going full ahead into hydrogen. Okay, and so the other thing is um, we, we need to just bring, the, you know, the, the concerns about hydrogen need to be resolved. Uh, and, and so that's what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, so solar energy. Let's talk about solar for a while. Um, 92 watts per square foot. This is how much sun, this is how much energy on the average falls on a square foot. If, if, imagine a 92 watt bulb, you know, every, every foot in a grid, um, that's what it would look like, a landscape of light bulbs. That's a lot of energy, and, and it's just coming down on us every day. Um, there, there's a, an old saying that uh, there's no energy shortage, the sun shines, the winds blow, the tides roll, and we're sitting on a molten rock. So here, here are some, speaking of energy sources, right now 13 terawatts is about the, 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 the global total of energy produced. Okay, and then this shows what, what each of the different alternatives can do. Hydroelectric can do one terawatt. Most of the good sites have been done already. Tides, biomass, and geothermal are pretty good. Nuclear can do a lot, but as we said, it's too dangerous. Wind could do a lot, but there's aesthetic problems with wind. Now look at solar. Here's solar. Okay, this is just 40 terawatts. It, an area the size of Colorado would power the whole planet, okay? So when you think about all the big empty spaces in the world, think about the Sahara Desert, and I mean, they're doing big ones now in, in, in the Mojave Desert. So this is not a lot of area compared to, uh, now, now here's a solar distribution map. The world leader right now is Germany, and look at Germany, they don't even get very much sun. Look at how much sun we get. Look at how much sun Africa gets. There's, there's been talk that you could just cover over a big chunk of Sahara Desert, it, you know, maybe 10 miles square, and you could pretty much, that's, that's 100 square miles, you could pretty much supply Europe with just a tiny slice of the Sahara Desert, and you'd, you'd have to make hydrogen to do it. Hydrogen, you, you, you know, that would be a, a way of doing it. Now, I'm not saying that's a good idea um, to, to, you know, do it in a centralized way, but, but Let's not kid ourselves. There's lots of solar energy around. Now, the good, the good news is the cost of the panels is coming down. Um, here's the cost of solar. And one of the things that in that, in that little trailer movie that I made, it, it, it kind of makes the, it puts forth the idea that 2015 is a big year. It really is. This is our, now, I made this like a year ago. And guess what? So far, it's up, it, it's right on. There's, there's places that there are a lot of places where solar energy is not just competitive with fossil fuel, it's, it's, you know, it's beating fossil fuel. There are other places where it hasn't caught up yet, but on the average, it's, it's really getting close. So we're, we're just about there on uh, the, the cost of solar becoming, uh, reaching parity with fossil fuel. Um, one of the big things too is, is financing. You can get, there's all kinds of new finance options. If you want to put solar panels on your roof, you can do it. This is how much land the, the, the yellow circle represents how much land would be required uh, in solar panels to supply the whole United States with electricity. So, the, and, and then the green, the green circle is how much we use for cropland. So, I mean, you know, that's not that much, really. And look at Nevada, you know, it just... <laughs> okay, so that area that we just saw is actually less than the rooftop area of all the, all the roofs in the United States. Uh, the, now, the idea is if, if, if we designed for it, we could supply pretty much all the power we need just with rooftops. Right now, they're not designed for it, so it wouldn't quite make it, but that could be changed. So what we're, we're, what we're looking at here is distributed solar. We don't, we don't want just more centralized power. There's, there's no need for it. We don't need a big grid. Um, and also, the, the, the better solar energy gets, it's becoming invisible. Um, a lot, you, you won't even be able to see it. Um, look at the products that are coming out. Solar roof shingles, paint, decking, paving, glass, sidewalks. So 
it's, it's kind of a problem when I'm doing photo simulations of solar because normally you want to just show these big blue panels, but the fact is those blue panels aren't going to be around that much longer. A, lo a lot of the thin film things are going to take over and you won't even see the solar. So I'll have to put in captions, you know, this is solar, this is solar. Okay, um, rooftop revolution. There's, there's all kinds of nice ways of, of putting solar on roofs uh, that are coming out, solar tiles. Now, I've been in, in uh, communication with people who are contractors, and apparently there, there have been problems with some of these products, but they're getting worked out. It's, it's, it's a brand new thing. All the wires have to fit together, all the, you know, the, the, the electrical connections. So they're, they're slowly getting worked out, but it's happening. Here's, here's solar shingles that look like slate. They don't even look like solar. Okay, so again, hydrogen. Hydrogen is what is required to make solar happen on a large scale. On a small scale, you don't really need hydrogen that much, but on a large scale, you really do. We need to be able to store the solar energy. Okay, so here's the normal benefits of hydrogen. Cleanness, there's zero fumes, there's zero greenhouse gases, and there's zero waste product that you have to get rid of. So it really is, uh, you know, I mean, as far as sustainability goes, it's a pretty much slam dunk situation. It's available and abundant. You could, it's made from water, it's made from sewage, it's made from garbage. You can make it all kinds of ways, as we're going to see a bit, little bit later. Um, so th there's, no, there's no reason why you have to have a big centralized plant, because you can make it lots of places. Um, it's scalable. You can do it. You can have a solar, um, uh, a solar system powering a whole city, a big giant skyscraper, or a cell phone. You could have little tiny batteries that go in you know, home electronics and, and, um, and, and laptop computers uh, that, that are they're, they're no bigger than batteries. They last longer than batteries. They don't, they, they don't fall off in performance as it runs down. So it, it's really a, you know, a better, it's a better, it's a better battery. That's what, hydrogen is a battery. That's what you have to think about. It's just another kind of battery. Okay, now, flexible and convenient. They, it, it, it can be very flexible and it can be very convenient and reliability. Now, these, these issues at the bottom are some of the things that have been problems in the past. Um, here's some of the, um, th th there are, what I found in, in my research in hydrogen is that um, there are the corporate players like Toyota and Shell Oil. Um, there, there, are, there are companies that are just going into solar because they know fossil fuels on the way out. And then there are what I call the lone wolf entrepreneurs. And, and that, that's these guys. And uh, Mike Strisky is someone I've met. Roger Billings is someone I'm going to go meet. Um, these, these are the ones who just, they come out with, um, it's just the good old American inventor story all over again. They, they come up with these inventions. Sometimes they get bought out by a big corporation who wants it shelved. And that's happened a lot. Um, this guy down in the lower left is, he got famous uh, during uh, Hurricane Sandy in the Northeast because his house was in New Jersey and it was the only house in the whole Northeast that still had power because he, he has a hydrogen house. So um, these guys are really interesting. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is just a really funky drawing of um, how it works. Sunlight comes down um, and now wait, this isn't, this isn't, uh, this is bypassing solar panels. This is a way of making hydrogen directly from sunlight and water. Uh, there's a company that's doing this down in Southern California. That's, that slide's actually not supposed to be there. Okay, here's a fuel cell. Uh, a fuel cell, now you guys have heard fuel cell a lot. So after today, hopefully you'll know it's exactly what, oops, exactly what a fuel cell does. Let's go, let's go back here for a second. Um, a fuel cell takes hydrogen and makes electricity out of it. Okay, that's what a fuel cell does. And, and with, with the electricity, you can either run a light bulb or just charge a battery, either way. Okay, so fuel cells make electricity. And, they, and look at they also emit pure drinking water. So water, electricity, and heat come out of a fuel cell. Okay, so here is, now here's a typical situation. You've got sun coming down on a solar panel. If, if you have a light that you'd like to light up right away, it'll do that. But most of the time, what you want to do is go uh, and, and use the electricity from the solar to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
And so you, you can have a, a water tank. On the left there is a water tank that feeds an electrolyzer. Uh, an electrolyzer is the opposite of a fuel cell. Electrolyzers, they make hydrogen out of electricity. So, so, ele so you know, ele hydrogen stores the electricity. You have to go from one to the other. Hydrogen takes it from electricity to uh, electrolyzers take it from um, electricity to hydrogen, and then your fuel cell takes it back to electricity. Okay, so so then you could have a so, so this could be technically if you had a big enough roof area, you could have a gas station that basically just has solar panels on a roof, and uh, and, a, and an electrolyzer and a tank, and and you've got a filling station. Now um, <clears throat> some of the big companies are going to do this. Walmart has recently realized that uh, they, they, they would like to change all their, fuel, all their forklifts over to fuel cell forklifts. So in order to, order to do that, they need to have uh, a place to refuel the forklifts. So they're building a fueling station at all the Walmarts for forklifts. And then they realized, hey, if we got a fueling station for forklifts, we could also sell gas, we could sell hydrogen to cars. That means they could cover their whole parking lot with solar panels and have enough hydrogen production to, to market it to cars. So this could be localized hydrogen production just with this system here. You could also put it in trains. And again, in, in, in a car or a train, you've got, you've got a, gas, a, 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 a tank, a very strong tank, by the way. They're making them out of carbon fiber. And um, they're, they're bulletproof. They're ex practically explosion proof. Here's, here's the other benefit of hydrogen. You get pure water. Now, you might, think, you might not think, you know, okay, how much pure water do you get? Well, when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, it was, what, four or five days. Uh, they generated, um, they had fuel cells on the spacecraft. And in the course of five days, they generated something like 120 gallons of pure water for drinking. So that came out of their you know, bodily fluids and, and you know, the, the air that they exhaled. Um, so it's, it's significant. It really does make some significant water. OK, now, here's, here, this one's really important. Most people don't realize. Look at how much water we use on power plants today. Um, we, we have 48, we use more water today co uh, cooling power plants than, than farms and livestock use. That's a huge number there. We would eliminate that if we used hydrogen. That's a whole new source of water. It's a water now, some of that water gets recycled. And, and sometimes, sometimes they don't recycle it well, and it becomes thermal pollution in a stream. But a lot of it just goes up in evaporation in these cooling towers for, for like a coal-fired plant. OK, we've got to talk about the naysayers. The naysayers are the ones who say, oh, this hydrogen thing is just too much um, ha hassle. It's too much trouble. Um, <clears throat> and this is a famous line here. There is no single solution. There are no magic bullets. <clears throat> we need a multiplicity of energy options. You know, that's spoken from somebody, that, that's, that's the words of somebody who doesn't want to change. For some reason, they like the way things are now, and they want to cast doubt that anything new is possible. It happened when Edison invented the light bulb. It happened when Fulton invented the steam, the, the steam engine. Every single time, there's people who say stuff like this. Sometimes there are magic bullets. Computers were a magic bullet. They really were. They, they, they changed everything. And so could, so could hydrogen. So these cliches might be nonsense. Yeah, you got to think about that. OK, hydrogen reality. <clears throat> there are lots of, um, these are examples of things that, that were, they really were magic bullets. The steam engine, the telephone, the airplane, and the computer changed history. So you know, we can expect these things to come along fairly regularly. OK, so um, that, that's what the, you know, we're saying solar hydrogen infrastructure is a, is a magic bullet. OK, now here are, the, here are the concerns. Safety, cost, efficiency, and logistics. OK, so the, big, the biggest one, you ask people on the street, what do you think about hydrogen? Oh, the Hindenburg. Hydrogen is, is explosive. So that's the first thing that they say. OK, so, so I want to talk about the three H's now. The Hindenburg, the H-bomb, and Hollywood. The, the, they have been instrumental in perpetuating the myth that hydrogen is too dangerous. And it is a myth. OK, so um, if you want to see scientific literature on this, Amory Lovins is, is a famous physicist. And he's written a lot. And he wrote something in 2003 that still has not been refuted called 20 Hydrogen Myths. So if, 
if anybody you know, starts saying stuff about hydrogen, I say, well, which of the 20 myths do you not agree with Amory Levins on? You know, cause, and, and, and where are your sources? Because a lot of times you read, uh, th there's actually a thing on the internet called 20 myths rebuked. And it's some, some Tea Party guy, and he just says, Amory Levins is all, all wet. And I looked for his, at his sources, like what references does he have? There were no primary sources. It's all anecdotal. So if you really look into it, you want a peer-reviewed you know, paper on hydrogen, this, this is a good one to start at. OK, here's just some empirical tests have been done. Gasoline car set on fire, hydrogen car set on fire. Hydrogen goes straight up. Now, if you're in an enclosed building, that could be a problem. OK, hydrogen can be dangerous if, you're, if it's enclosed. All you have to do is put a ventilation system in, end of problem. OK, because hydrogen just wants to go up. It's the lightest element. Okay, here is the Oakland freeway meltdown that happened in, uh, what was it, 2007? Uh, a, high, a, a, tanker, a gasoline tanker truck crashed and basically melted down the whole freeway. And so when people say hydrogen is dangerous, compared to what? You know, what we're driving around now is dangerous. There's all kinds of really dangerous things on the roads now. OK, so, but what are the cars going to do about it? What are the cars going to do about um, explosion, explosion and, and flame danger? Well, what they're doing is they're, they're coming out with really high-tech plumbing. It has to be high-tech because hydrogen is, it tends to leak. If you have normal plumbing, it will leak. So you have to have better plumbing. So that's what they came up with. Then they came up with better gas tanks. These are carbon fiber tanks. These tanks will, will withstand, the, here was a 60 mile an hour crash didn't even dent it. They, they, they're, they're built to withstand close range gunfire shots, dynamite. The, the, these tanks, it, everything else in the car will be gone before these tanks are damaged. So that's, now Toyota and, and Hyundai are coming out this year. Toyota just announced, what, last week I think they, they came out with their car. Hyundai had already came out a couple months ago. Um, Honda, um, well you can just name them off. There's, there's about half a dozen, basically all the major car companies are doing fuel cell cars. And they're doing it with high pressure tanks, which is 10,000 PSI. Now, that's, I think that's going to be a temporary thing. I think that there's something else that's going to that's be better than that. But for now, they're doing high pressure tanks because they want to be able to get enough hydrogen into the tank to, to be able to go 300 miles. Um, th and, and, and this is, compa you know, as compared to battery cars, you know, the, uh, electric cars now that run on just batteries alone, they can go typically under 100 miles on a charge. And then when you have to charge them up, it takes a couple hours. And then when you, um, oh, also, if it's cold, they, they don't last as long. There's all kinds of um, dependability problems with electric vehicles. Um, hydrogen will solve these problems, by the way. So I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. OK, so, so another thing that naysayers say is that they're too expensive. Well, they were. Look, look at how much they cost in, in 2002. They cost what five times more than they do now. I mean, the the price has come way down. So th th this debate's been going on for 30 years about hydrogen. Things are changing now. Things are really happening now. Okay. Also, it's <clears throat> hydrogen cars are electric cars. So don't think of, don't think about it as and and all hydrogen cars have batteries. Okay. So it's not it's not batteries versus hydrogen. It's batteries alone versus hydrogen plus batteries. Hydrogen plus batteries gets the best of both worlds. And bat so, so when people say, well, batteries are going to get better, well, we good. You know, that's good. That's a good thing, because that'll make hydrogen cars better, too. OK, so here are some of the issues that have to be, when you want to think about whether to go to hydrogen, um, do we want centralized hydrogen production or distributed? Do we want? Do, do we want something that's very common in our society? I've been struggling with it my whole life because I couldn't decide what to major on in college because I wanted to study everything. Um, but they say, no, you've got you to specialize in one thing. And so we have a very over-specialized society. And, and that's got consequences. There's, there's problems with that. And, and uh, the environmental problems we're seeing now are, are, are one of them. Now, um, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, things take time. We, we, have to, we can't go too fast on anything. And other people say, no, 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 no. Paradigm shift just changes everything. It, history is not a linear thing. It kind of goes in lurches. And there, there's, there's kind of like big breakthroughs and then, and then quiet for a while. So um, don't, be, don't be fooled that um, 
you know, we can't make very quick progress. When people look at climate change, they say, this is too serious. We don't have time. Um, I say, yeah, we do. We, we can change really quick. I mean, if we, things can, especially with, things, with tools like the Internet, things can change quickly. And, so, and then we have technocracy versus grassroots movement. So, Okay, so here are the remaining doubts. Now, until fairly recently, people were saying, well, it still costs too much, and it's still too hard to use, and, and, and there's still safety issues. People will say, what about these high-pressure tanks on these cars? You know, there's still high pressure. If you get a, in a big enough crash, you know, it's, it's like a, they'll say it's like a bomb. And uh, whether that's true or not, that's what they'll say. So, so now some new developments have pretty much, th these were the remaining three issues. These are pr pretty much solved now. So I'm going to tell you about that. So, uh, what it, so now I'm going to go back to another personal story. After the, after the um, Sun Train got put on the table, the next thing was, okay, let's, let's try. I decided I wanted to make a documentary film about hydrogen. So I wanted to raise money. I did a crowdfunding campaign. I got about one third of the money I wanted and decided it wasn't, it wasn't working. So I called it off and I realized the reason my, why my crowdfunding campaign did not work is because I didn't have enough of a network. I need to start calling people on the phone and getting to know people. So for, that's what I've been doing ever since then. For the past year, I've just been getting to know everybody in the hydrogen world who's anybody and, uh, and, and talking to them. Uh, and, and they're usually pretty, pretty anxious to talk to somebody about it. So that's what's been going on. Um, this, is a bunch, uh, this is a slide I didn't finish. But these are some of the people. Um, these guys, Mike Strisky, Chris McWinney, Roy McAllister, Roger Billings, um, I, these are these lone wolf entrepreneur guys who I called up and talked to them and got to know them. Uh, I've, met, I've met all but one of them. Uh, and then one of them called up a guy named Mike Henning in, in Dallas, Texas. And, and Mike Henning called me up and said, we need to talk. And he's a filmmaker in, t in Dallas. And he saw that I was trying to make a documentary film about hydrogen. And he said, I'm making a documentary film about hydrogen. Let's join forces. Mike Henning made a movie about hemp. It's called Hempsters Plant the Seed. It's the definitive film on hemp. And, and he had, you know, uh, Woody Harrelson was in it, Ralph Nader, Willie Nelson. All these celebrities were in it. And it was all about how hemp, which is a cousin of marijuana, is actually a very, it's, it's, a, it's like a miracle crop. It does all these great things. Why are we not, why is it illegal? It's crazy. So he, so he, did, a, he did a huge thing for the hemp uh, controversy. And as a result, it, it's pretty fair to say, as a result, several states have actually changed their laws about hemp. There's still federal laws, and that's probably going to change too, but several states now have said, okay, it's okay, okay to grow hemp instead of importing it from Canada, which is what, it was, what was happening. Okay, so Mike led me to a guy named Ray Gwynn. And Ray Gwynn is, is a guy, now, when I, when I talk about people over-specialized and people who are not over-specialized, sometimes I like to say there's, like, there's like the specialists and there's the generalists. The generalists are the ones like Chris Swan who, who put things together. They, they integrate lots of different things and think of new ways to put them together. This guy, Ray Gwynn, is one of those people. And, and Ray Gwynn called me up and asked me, um, I, I found out what he was doing. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a little, um, the, he, he came up with a company, and he's not a scientist, that solved all, basically solved all the remaining problems in hydrogen. And he's not the only one, but he, he's one of them. So I'm going to show you um, the cost of hydrogen is the first one. BioHigh Energy and its sister company, URH2, are new startup energy companies from Texas that have solved two of the most important problems facing renewable energy today, hydrogen affordability and hydrogen infrastructure. BioHigh is actually solving two problems. In making hydrogen uniquely affordable, it's also ridding us of landfill garbage, raw sewage, and agricultural waste that otherwise might end up as pollution. Capturing methane from landfills and sewage and making usable energy from it, either as heat or electricity for buildings, is nothing new. It's actually become common. What is new is converting that methane to hydrogen and doing it in a way that yields uniquely low-cost hydrogen. So while methane, when captured, can be useful, Hydrogen is much more useful because it's much more flexible. It's not damaging to the atmosphere. It can be sold on the open commodity market. And now it can even be used as a vehicle fuel. But up
up to now, the making of hydrogen has been a problem. Currently, the most common and least expensive way to produce it is by what's called steam methane reformation from natural gas. Here's the process. The cornerstone to biohize operation is a new way to make hydrogen called bioreformation. Its advantages over traditional steam methane reformation are multiple. It's simpler, it's more scalable, it's cleaner, it's less dangerous and volatile, it's easier to distribute, and it's dramatically less expensive. If bioreforming were merely cost competitive with SMR, that in itself would be a breakthrough. But look at the bottom line here. Look at these numbers. A kilogram of hydrogen is about the energy equivalent of one gallon of gasoline. So when you first see these numbers, it sounds like the same as nine to twelve dollars for a gallon of gasoline. Not too good. But keep in mind that a fuel cell car has three times the efficiency of an internal combustion engine car, which makes it more like a competitive three to four dollars for one gallon equivalency. Now look at bioreforming. Instead of nine to twelve dollars per kilogram for dirty hydrogen, it's two to four dollars a kilogram for clean hydrogen. The process is fully patented, there's a prototype, it's ready to go. Hydrogen is ready to go. After decades of slow development, uncertainty, and being on the sidelines, the pieces are now in place for hydrogen to enter the mainstream, go prime time, and displace fossil fuels as the primary energy currency. For both investors and green city planners, this is a golden opportunity. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> what I do <laughs> is I, I take chances on startup companies. And I did, I did that with, with SunTrain, and that one didn't work. So uh, I'm, doing now, I'm doing it now with this company. And uh, it, looks, it looks really good. I'm really, I'm really happy with it. So what I did is I made a couple of videos for these guys in exchange for stock. So hopefully uh, it's going to work. I think we have our first client already. So uh, now, here's a question. If you can make... Now, now, I, I want to just emphasize, we're not just talking about you know, the cheapest renewable hydrogen. We're not just talking about the cheapest hydrogen. It's actually cheaper than gasoline now. This is, this is like revolutionary. Um, if, so you might ask, well, if, if we can make all this hydrogen just from biomass, what do we even need solar for? Well, because there's not enough biomass to make all the, all the energy we need. We can, you know, it's, been, it's been calculated maybe 30% of our hydrogen we can get from biomass. But as a way to get past the chicken and the egg problem, right now, you can, you can st we've got a client now in, in Indonesia, uh, and they have a landfill, and they want to turn it into hydrogen because they want to sell the hydrogen. One of the things that's great about hydrogen instead of methane is it's really hard to sell methane. You, you can heat nearby buildings. You can supply electricity to nearby buildings. You can supply electricity to the grid. But from the people I've been talking to who actually have tried to do this, they say it's not that easy to sell electricity to the grid because they have their grid balancing issues. So, but if you can make it into hydrogen, you've got a product that you can sell on the open commodity market. It's, it's completely, um, it, it just, there's a great, um, now what is methane? Methane is poop gas, okay? Just so you guys know, let's be clear here. When your bathroom doesn't smell good, that's methane, okay? And it's kind of interesting because Methane is what the climate scientists are saying we have to really be afraid of because if all the tundra starts melting, it, you know, it, all of a sudden it's going to start rotting, huge amounts of methane get, get released, and that's a big problem. That could, that could just um, drown our whole atmosphere with methane, which is, uh, oh, and methane is 21 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So methane's a really serious gas that we cannot let get into the atmosphere too much. So on one hand, Methane is the one thing that, I mean, it could end civilization if we don't, if, 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 you know, if, if things didn't go right. On the other hand, methane might, maybe it'll save civilization because we can make hydrogen from it really cheap. Not even the gasoline can compete with it. So, so that's what, the, the, so the, this, this is basically the cost issue solved. Um, now, there's another way to make hydrogen from garbage. And this reminds me of when Arthur Clarke talked about the, the fusion torch. 
The fusion torch is really hot. How, how hot's a fusion torch, Paul? Paul's a... Hot, really hot. Yeah, <laughs> like 100 million degrees, something like that. Just crazy hot. Well, this isn't that hot. It's 25,000 degrees. But this pretty much dissociates all molecules down to their elemental, d d down to the elements. So, so you end up with, you know, here's your bin full of iron, here's your bin full of aluminum. So this is really exciting. Now this is expensive to build these things, and it takes a lot of energy to run this torch, okay? But there's a net, depending on the source you read, sometimes they say you can get 50% of the energy left to sell, in, in, you know, to make hydrogen with. So it pays for itself and it's pretty much the ultimate recycling. Now there's a lot of controversy about plasma gasification, pyrolysis, there's about half a dozen different ways to make, um, to make waste into energy, and there's environmental groups who are protesting some of them. Some of it's from people who are in the recycling business, and this is gonna put them out of business. You know? So um, talk to me more if you wanna hear about that controversy, because I've been, I've been boning up on that. Okay, here's another slide uh, that's kind of hard to get. So anyway, let's go on. <laughs> okay, so the next thing after the cost of hydrogen is, okay, how do you store it? Do we really have to pump up, do we really have to pressurize gas tanks to 10,000 pounds per square inch and, and have expensive compressors and expensive plumbing? Do we really have to do that? The answer is no, there's another, there's another solution. Um, and, and this is Ray Gwynn's company again. And like I said, this guy's not a scientist, but he's got so many connections all over the place that he finds out about things and puts things together. He's a systems integrator, son of a Texas oil man. Urban Renewable Hydrogen, URH2, is a U.S. energy startup company devoted to transitioning towards a new and completely clean energy infrastructure based on hydrogen. Its services and product offerings will focus on two areas. First, it will harness the untapped potential of garbage, sewage, and agricultural waste by capturing methane emission and converting it into pure hydrogen. Surprisingly, this process is lower in cost than any other current mode of hydrogen production. Second, URH2 will use the hydrogen it makes, at least initially, to target niche markets such as forklifts. There are over 20 million forklifts in the world and unlike cars, they don't require huge numbers of fueling stations. This means URH2 can bypass the proverbial chicken and egg problem by concentrating on large institutions like big box retailers to replace their entire forklift fleets with new hydrogen powered forklifts. URH2 has two key advantages for entering the forklift market. The first is a newly patented, uniquely convenient, and uniquely cost-effective canister concept for containing the hydrogen. The second concerns what goes in the canisters. Many in the hydrogen industry know about hydrides, a way of storing hydrogen that, by bonding it to metals, eliminates virtually all safety risks, as well as any need to compress or liquefy the hydrogen gas. With their exclusive patent portfolio, URH2 is uniquely positioned to implement what is now the most advanced hydride technology. It contains four times the energy density of lithium batteries, twice the energy density of liquid hydrogen, with no need for refrigeration, and 2.5 to 5 times the compactness of the compressed hydrogen typically in use today, with no need for expensive compressors and extra safety equipment. It's also significantly lighter than all the other hydrides. With mass production and economies of scale, the cost of this revolutionary product is now set to decline dramatically. This is especially true with the U.S. military's recent decision, including both the Army and Navy, to invest heavily in this advanced hydride hydrogen battery. When that happens, the door opens up for URH2 to enter the vast new markets, including all manner of stationary and mobile power supply needs. The future is bright for URH2. Early investment possibilities are now open. Hello, I'm Ray Gwynn. I'm CEO of URH2. With our unique patent portfolio, we're at the leading edge of how energy is manufactured, stored, and distributed. 
We're open for early investments. Please call me anytime at 214-796-4033. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things this guy did recently is he went to Taiwan, and in Taiwan they have a, a technology of, uh, sc of hydrogen scooters. And they have the scooters, um, they run on hydrogen. The hydrogen is put in hydride form. There's two thermos bottle size canisters about this big, and, and two of those canisters will, will run one of these scooters for 50 miles. So they're using what's called nickel metal hydride. Um, what, what this is talking about is a new kind of hydride called, it's basically aluminum hydride. I didn't want to say it there because they didn't have the patents yet, but now they do. And it was, aluminum hydride was developed at Savannah River National Laboratories uh, who used to make components for H-bombs. So they were doing you know, stuff with hydrogen for a long time. Um, this company now has exclusive rights to, to use um, the, the, the aluminum hydride along with another company called Artica, which is making military stuff. So the military, you know, for whatever you think about the military, they're driving this technology now really strong. So, th so that's, really, that's really great. Uh, Ray Gwynn just went over to Taiwan and made a deal with the, 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 the Taiwan scooter company is very conservative. They just, they're not interested in spreading anywhere off the island of Taiwan. And so Ray basically got, uh, for, for North America and potentially for Europe too, the rights to bring that canister technology with hydrides. Now, one of the things that I thought when I first heard about hydrides is, wait a minute, you're bonding the metal to, to, you're bonding the hydrogen to metal. How could that be more compact than liquid hydrogen? It's twice as dense as liquid hydrogen. And the best metaphor is, when you do a hydride, you're putting the hydrogen mole molecules to sleep. You're basically making them inert, so they're not jumping around, bouncing off each other. They're, they're, they're just, it's like you put a bunch of bratty kids to sleep, and now, now you can stack them really close. So that's how it works. This pretty much completely solves the safety issues and the, the convenience issues with hydrogen. And, and this is, like I said, this is really new. This is, this is most people who I tell about this they have never heard of it. Um, so, it. So the chicken and the egg problem seems to be solved. Okay, so um, the bottom line is uh, it's the only energy strategy that seems to be uh, with a potential to completely replace fossil fuel. And, and I'm sure that the people in the fossil fuel industry will try to cast doubt on that, but it, just look at the facts. Um, it, it could pretty much solve the environmental, economic, political, and water shortage problems as well. Um, so I think we have reason to be excited about the future. The, the hydrogen society uh, will be brought on by both market forces and grassroots forces. And the Indonesia, uh, this, uh, I, I might be going to Indonesia <laughs> this month uh, because our first client with URH2 seems to be a landfill in Indonesia and they want to make hydrogen right away. So. Hopefully, I'm um, keeping my fingers crossed on that one. Um, being optimistic about the future is not just a nice thing. It's a really important thing. There's a guy named Fred Pollack who wrote a book uh, a couple decades ago called The Image of the Future. And he did, he did um, research into history and looked at how a society's image of the future correlates with what happened to that society. What he found out is that the image of the future is oftentimes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, you can get in debates about a cause and effect. Well, did this happen because of that or the other way around? But the fact is, it seems to be really important that we have a positive image of the future. And we're not getting that. We're getting from Hollywood, all they seem to want to do is put out dystopian movies about how messed up things are going to get. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity to change that. Uh, and, and you know, it's basically, what do we want kids to dream about? You know, you could have positive imagery like this. Or you can, or more of the same. You know, all these computer games are pretty much about, you know, dealing with some horrible thing that's happening. Okay. Now, one one group in Hollywood who has who has changed that, or is trying to change that. Some of you guys have seen this TV series Cosmos, and and I, I have a clip here from Cosmos. Um, well, here's. Uh, before we go to that, here's, here's a, uh, a friend of mine uh, gave me this quote. Uh, so I want to tie this in with landscape, landscape design. When I was in school, I thought of landscape architecture and landscape design as making pretty gardens for rich people. Okay? That's, I, I didn't think it was important enough. That's changed now. Every, all of a sudden, 
you know, we're talking about we got to make green cities. And so urban planning and, and, and landscape design need to merge. And landscape designers need to get more out there and start marketing what they want to do with every trick in the book. So um, I'm, I'm really excited here at Academy of Art um, for the fact that this school has the capability to do high-end animation, high-end film production. This, there's really some, some um, exciting potential here. That'll do it, folks. Thank you.